Welcome to another Hoopo video. Today we're going to be looking at a uh, paper from Nature Biotechnology, so something a little bit outside of the machine learning uh, field, which is where we usually spend our time. Today we're going to be looking at a robotics paper, specifically biorobotics, specifically high throughput microbial culturenomics using automation and machine learning. So Culturenomics is, I guess, the practice of cultivating bacteria cultures. So, kind of like farming, but for bacteria. And the high throughput here, I guess, uh, you want to be able to do that efficiently. And automation here, I think we're going to see, but it's basically going to come down to robot arms and computer vision, which is why we're reading this paper. So. You can see how the way that nature paper work or biotech papers, nature's a journal. You can see just how slow this process is. Look at that. This was actually submitted on in 2021 and it didn't get accepted until 2023. And it really wasn't even published until another month after that. So this kind of goes to show you how in the machine learning world where work is kind of getting published as soon as it's done. And it's very recent in other fields of science. It can be much, much slower. So yeah, this is almost three-year-old work at this point. So let's see. Pure bacterial cultures remain essential for detailed experimental and mechanistic studies in microbiome research. Okay, so microbiome, perhaps the gut microbiome. Traditional methods to isolate individual bacteria from complex microbial ecosystems are labor intensive. Isolate individual bacteria. Okay, so maybe they want to pick out individual bacteria from a microbiome. So I could imagine how you get a sample of some sort, you're going to have potentially hundreds of different types of bacteria, and you want to isolate each individual one. Labor intensive, dis difficult to scale, lack phenotype genotype integration. So, phenotype, I think, is the physical manifestation of a certain genetic uh, code. So, uh, the phenotype would be, for example, brown hair versus blonde hair. And then, genotype is the actual genetic code that corresponds to some specific phenotype. Here we describe an open source, high throughput robotic strain. Okay, here we go. Open source, high throughput robotic strain isolation platform for rapid generation of isolates on demand. Okay, so open source means the code is open source. I doubt they're manufacturing their own robot. They're probably using an off the shelf robotic arm. High throughput, I guess just how many uh, actions, how many things, how many strain isolations per minute. I assume that this will hopefully be a step function improvement over previous versions of this. Uh, strain isolation there, again, it, I'm kind of just reading in, reading into what they're saying here, but it sounds like they're trying to isolate individual bacteria from a microbiome sample. And I think isolates are probably the result of strain isolation. We develop a machine learning approach that leverages col colony morphology, so the appearance of a specific bacterial colony, and genomic data to maximize the diversity of microbes isolated and enable targeted picking of specific genre. Genera. Okay, so basically, it sounds like they're going to have a robot arm that picks out specific genres of microbes so they can do this strain isolation. Application of this platform on fecal samples are, all right, there we go. We finally know what they're doing. They're, it's poo. So they're taking poo from about 20 humans. They're probably smearing it on some uh, agar, right? Some of that like uh, gelatin looking stuff that they can grow gut bacteria or they, that you can grow bacteria on. And then they're getting a uh, robot to pick through the bacteria that grow from this uh, poo sample and 
perform strain isolation. So then you can basically figure out exactly what the different strains of bacteria are in a fecal sample. So everyone's all about the gut microbiome right now. So gut microbiome biobanks totaling 26,000 isolates. represent 80% of all abundant taxa. Spatial analysis on 100,000 visually captured colonies reveals co-growth patterns between Ruminococcae, Coccaceae, Coccaceae, Bacteriodacea, Oreobacteriaceae, and Bifidobacteriaceae, Bacteriaceae. I don't know how to say that, but co-growth patterns probably refers to um, a specific way that's, that uh, specific types of bacteria will grow within a agar plate. So maybe here they're suggesting interactions between the different gut bacteria in your gut microbiome, which I think Kind of makes sense. There's probably kind of there's probably interactions between them. Some of them probably help each other. Some of them are more antagonistic, and so on. Comparative analysis of a 1,197 high quality genomes from these biobanks shows interesting intra and interpersonal strain evolution, selection, and horizontal gene transfer. Okay, so. Obviously, bacteria are evolving at a faster rate because they live shorter lives and they're just generally smaller with simpler genomes. So it seems like within a specific person, the microbiome you have is going to actually evolve and there's going to be different selection pressures and horizontal gene transfer. So uh, I think bacteria have a way of actually capturing uh, genetic code from other bacteria that are not even related or not even the same species. I think it's called plasmids. Plasmid horizontal gene transfer. Yeah. Here we go. This is the image I remember. So one bacterium contains a plasmid, the connection forms, the plasmid is copied, both bacteria now contain the plasmid. So basically bacteria have the ability to, of course, not just uh, reproduce uh, and create more copies of themselves, but they have the ability to basically shuffle the DNA around with other bacteria. So that's a way for strains of bacteria to evolve. This culturenomics framework should empower new research efforts to systematize the collection and quantitative analysis of imaging-based phenotypes with high-resolution genomics data for many emerging microbiome studies. Metagenomics offers the ability to broadly survey the composition of diverse microbial ecosystems. Broadly survey composition of diverse microbial ecosystems, ranging from soil communities to the gut microbiome. Okay, so... Basically, you can uh, take either a sample of dirt or a sample of poo. And at the end of the day, poo and dirt are basically kind of the same thing. You know, poo or soil is just really the dirt of 10,000 million years worth of animals and dead things just over time, right? Yet microbes need to be isolated and cultured to mechanistically dissect their functional roles in habitat and the myriad of interspecies processes that occur. Traditional cultivation methods rely on brute force, random colony picking, and are tedious and labor intensive. Okay, so we don't know what brute force here means, but um, it seems like you have a sample, you create a colony, or you create a kind of slide or some kind of tray, some kind of agar plate, and then you're going to pick out individual colonies from that. And maybe the brute force uh, refers to the fact that it's a human doing it. Several dilution-based isolation methods using 96 or 384 wells are resource-intensive and result in repeated isolation of the same dominant strains. 
Okay, so you have this problem where you tend to pick the same strains over and over again. Microfluidic systems enable growth in nanolite, nanoliter reactors, but colonal isol clonal isolates are difficult to extract. Okay, so microfluidics is basically small fluid. So I think this more refers to probably little tiny pipettes and little tiny test tubes where uh, nanoliter reactors, this probably refers to uh, nanoliter is a very, very small unit of volume measurement, right? A liter is... Uh, you could have a liter of water, so nanoliter probably refers to a tiny little test tube where you're growing a tiny little strain of bacteria. Given that a typical microbiome can contain hundreds to thousands of unique species, oh, fucking up on the uh, highlighting here. Exhibiting a long-tailed abundance distribution. That is, few dominate while most are rare. Okay, so the distribution of microbes within the microbiome is going to be basically a handful of very dominant bacteria that are very, very prominent, and almost all of them are these few. And then you're going to have this long tail of unique bacteria. So it's kind of like a classification problem where... Uh, the majority of the images are cats. I don't think of it that way. There's one or two classes that dominate the classification problem, but there's a, a very long tail of categories that you could potentially classify samples into. Microbes can be distinguished based on their diverse phenotypes, whether by their ability to grow in a certain media or the metabolites they produce. Growth-based selection can enhance the isolation of rare species, for example, with growth media containing different nutrients or antibiotics. Okay, interestingly, so the growth media, what I keep calling the agar here, let me make sure that I'm using the word correctly here, but agar is a jelly-like substance uh, that you grow cells in. Yeah, so it's like, it's what they grow bacteria in. I'm not sure that's what they're using here, but it seems like basically you could take the growth medium, you can, can t you could put different nutrients in it or different antibiotics, and in that way, isolate specific species. So you're doing this classification problem from a fecal sample or a soil sample. There is potentially thousands of unique species in here, in that sample, but there's also going to be a couple species that dominate. So you can basically create different filters for specific species using antibiotics and specific nutrients and then hopefully be able to have perfect uh, recall, I think is the more important uh, metric here, right? You have precision and you have recall. So recall means that you can, let's bring it, let's break it out, precision versus recall. So. When you're doing these kind of uh, detections or classification tasks, right? Precision is about uh, true positive rate over all detected elements, right? So of the bacteria that you detect, how many of them are the correct strain or they're correctly identified? And that's important, but I'm going to suspect that recall is more important. And recall is how many of them are you actually detecting to begin with, right? And I imagine in this kind of long tail distribution that they're describing here, where you have thousands of unique species that are actually very, or that only have a few representative uh, individual microbes, you want to be able to pick out all of them, right? So recall, recalling how many of the actual microbes are you accurately detecting? Are you able to detect, right? If you get a couple wrong, it's fine, You just, but you don't want to miss any. Mass spectrometry. Spectra can also be used to differentiate between the species. So mass spectrometry is a different technique than... Uh, here it sounds like they're describing like the DNA somehow, or like... I don't, know. I don't know how they're actually classifying these. Let's see. Mass 
spectrometry is low throughput and requires manual processing. Imaging activated cell sorting has been developed to isolate eukaryotic cells based on multidimensional imaging. Okay, so they're already using some form of computer vision. I don't know what multidimensional imaging here means. Maybe it means multiple cameras or specific types of cameras. This method requires sophisticated instrumentation and has not been implemented for bacteria. With recent advances in AI and deep learning models trained to discern nuanced features in multidimensional imaging and biologic data, ML of combined phenotypic and genomic data streams is poised to transform next generation microbial culture nomics. Okay, so they're kind of hinting at some kind of multimodal based machine learning model here, right? So multiple modality, multiple modalities referring to the fact that you're not just going to be using uh, imaging, but you're also going to be using uh, biological data, which might be the output of some DNA sequencing, right? So your model that is performing the classification of microbes is looking at both image modalities and it's looking at kind of maybe the tabular looking data that would come out of a uh, DNA sequencer. And maybe also uh, the information that comes out of a mass spectrometer. Here we describe an ML guided robotic strain isolation and genotyping platform that enables rapid and high throughput generation of cultured biobanks on demand. ML guided robotic strain isolation and genotyping platform. The system uses an intelligent imaging-based algorithm to increase the taxonomic diversity of culturenomics compared to random picking method. Okay, so this is kind of the benchmark that they're comparing to is this random picking, where I assume you just kind of sample random points within the agar plate. So maybe in random picking, you just kind of pick 10 different random points, and then in their imaging-based method, they kind of specifically choose regions to pick the bacteria out of. We demonstrated the utility of this system by anaerobic, aerobically generating personalized isolate biobanks of 20 human participants, yielding a total of 26,000 isolates. Okay, so these are the individual samples that the robot picks out with 1,197 high quality draft genomes spanning 39,416S. Samplicon sequence variants. I don't know what those are. Amplicon sequence variants. An amplicon sequence variants is any one of the inferred DN single DNA sequence recovered from a high throughput analysis of marker genes. Okay. So basically, PCR. PCR is a type of uh, sequencing. And or no, PCR itself is actually how you create DNA, and it's part of a sequencing process. Okay, so PCR is basically you duplicate the DNA and then you sequence it, and you have these marker genes. Uh, marker gene is usually determined if a nucleic has been successfully inserted. Okay, so amplicon sequence variants is basically some kind of DNA sequencing technique or part of some kind of DNA sequencing technique. Using the paired genomic and morphological information for each isolate, we trained an ML model that can predict taxonomic identity based on colony morphology. Okay, so basically it sounds like they're, the ground truth information is coming from DNA sequencing, but then they want to basically be able to train a machine learning model that looks at just an overhead image of the actual uh, microbial growth and then is able to classify it into the correct uh, species of bacteria. So they have the ground truth label coming from actual DNA sequencing, but they want to eventually train a machine learning model that can just detect the specific visual appearance of a colony, right? What they keep calling colony morphology. Application of this ML model led to an improvement in targeted isolation of microbes of interest, large scale imaging analysis of all colonies grown on agar plates, All right, So they do eventually mention that it's agar plates. So we were correct in our assumption there. Uh. 
whole genome analysis from personalized biobanks uncovered person-specific strain level variation, and signatures of horizontal gene transfer within major gut phyla. We still got this horizontal gene transfer. We further developed an open access web database. All right, that's pretty cool. So they put all their data on the internet. Search by isolate, search by morphology. So actually, here you go. So this is the uh, what they were calling the long tail distribution of your gut bacteria. So most of your gut bacteria is actually composed of this one here, bacterio, bacterio, bacteriodaceae. And you can see how basically the first two types of bacteria are extremely prevalent and then it very quickly dies down but you have a very long tail of different types of bacteria here so uh, this is actually an image of their system and you can see here they have some kind of robotic arm here that's picking specific parts so it seems like actually the robotic arm doesn't actually do the picking itself. It just moves the whole tray and then puts the whole tray on. But then you have basically these, this rotating table of little pipette looking needle things that do the actual colony picking and transferring. So they're picking from a plate, an agar plate, and then they're putting it into one of these uh, micro arrays, I think they're called, micro array biology. It's these like plates. Yeah, this is what a micro array looks like. It's like a plate where you put the stuff in. There might be more narrow definitions of micro array. Uh, the one that is a little bit more human sized might be called something else. And these might not be specifically microwaves, but it's kind of that same energy, right? Where you can basically have a grid of little uh, isolated cells, kind of like a beehive. And then each of those isolated cells, uh, you put samples into them so that you can do a bunch of imaging one go or. Uh, yeah, so here's the actual imaging here. So. Dual illumination imaging, epi, and then trans, so different types of light, it actually seems like they're doing here. Let's actually zoom in. So you see they're doing kind of a different lighting. They have uh, what seems like white lighting and then what seems like red lighting. And then from this, here's the actual computer vision happening where they're doing the segmentation. So each of these spots represents uh, kind of a, uh, bacterial colony, right? And the way that a bacterial colony is going to grow on an agar plate is it's going to start from a specific locus and then it's gonna like kind of grow out. And the way that it grows and the appearance that it has under these different types of lights and these different cameras is going to result in a different uh, look of this colony, which means that you can use some kind of computer vision to, to actually uh, classify each of these colonies but in order to do that you're actually going to need to know the ground truth right like what actually is this colony so that's where they're going to be using their picking colony picking so they're going to pick out specific they're going to send their robot arm into this specific area here and then pick from that specific colony and then they're going to use their uh, dna sequencing to tell you exactly what that colony was right and then that'll give them a ground truth label and then they'll be able to train a machine learning system to uh, given an image, tell you exactly what the uh, type of colony is. That is cool. All right, so containing searchable gen genotypic, morphologic and phenotypic data of all isolates generated by automated culturenomics as a unique and expanding community resource for the microbiome field. Data-driven culturenomics using phenotypes and automation. Colony picking is a classic microbiology method, microbiology method for clonally isolating bacterial strains. So colony picking is this uh, idea, I guess, of having a 
big plate that has a variety of different colonies on it and then isolating out each individual strain by picking from the colonies that are going to be specific to a particular strain. So you would pick samples from each of these uh, center points here. Colony growth depends on many factors, such as the composition of the media, atmospheric conditions, presence of inhibitory molecules, pH, humidity, and effects of other diffusible metabolites derived from nearby colonies. So not only is the uh, environment super important, but then also the uh, nearby colonies, right? So in here, uh, the fact that this colony is growing close to this colony means it's going to have a different morphology, a different kind of appearance than maybe perhaps this colony, which could be of the same strain. So even just the nearness of strains to each other is also going to affect the morphology. Colony morphologies are observed based on strain-specific physiological differences influenced by cell shape, rigidity, motility, and growth kinetics as well as production of pigmented molecules or extracellular matrices and surfactants. Production of pigmented molecules. So specific microbes might produce specific pigments, which will make them much easier to detect with computer vision. These colony traits are readily quantifiable. They are rarely documented. Okay, so there's a lack of available data, which is always bad, but I mean, it makes it easier to get good results if you first person to collect a very good extensive data set. Selective colony picking using visual features is generally qualitative and not standardized. To address these shortcomings, we devised a platform dubbed, here's the actual name of it, Culturenomics by Automated Microbiome Imaging and Isolation, KAMI. That's where they get the name here, KAMI. Chemi platform consists of four key elements. So you have one, an imaging system that collects morphology data of colonies, and an AI guided colony selection algorithm. So, I mean, this probably just means computer vision. An automated colony picking robot. So you have the actual robot. Here, this is uh, normally what's called a SCARA arm. Yeah. So a SCARA is a type of industrial robot where the uh, basically have one rotational joint here, one rotational joint here, and then usually an up and down joint here, right? And this is different from uh, a seven DOF robot arm. Right, so most of the robots that you think of when you think of a, a robot arm and, for example, a welding application or some kind of industrial application have many degrees of freedom, such as here there's seven degrees of freedom on a KUKA arm. Uh, here you have a, I think this is a panda arm, also a high amount of degree of freedom. And the reason you need those high amounts of degree of freedom is that you have to be able to control the end effector orientation, right? You want to be able to, when you're doing something like welding, you don't just want to move to a specific location, but you also need to be able to orient the end effector in that end location. Versus for something like uh, this application here, right? This microbial array picking, you don't need to control the, the orientation of the end effector. You just need to basically have up and down motion and then be able to go anywhere within a 2D space. And that's where uh, limiting the total amount of degrees of freedom actually helps you because the Ascara robot is going to be uh, significantly cheaper than uh, something like a 7 DOF robot. So the choice of robot here makes a ton of sense. Basically just pick a robot that is relatively cheap and of course you want something that is very very fast right high throughput you don't want to spend a lot of time executing complicated motions with complicated end effector movements right you want very simple linear and like that okay so that's part one is the imaging the computer vision part two is the actual robot 
Part three here is a cost-effective pipeline to rapidly generate genomic data. So this is the actual sequencing. Uh, I don't know very much about sequencing at all. I assume there's some kind of machine that you have to put like a little pipette into, or maybe the machines allow kind of uh, a whole array of these little micro pipettes. I don't know. And here we have the last part, a physically isolate biobank and digital database with searchable colony morphology. Okay, so they call it physical isolate biobank and digital database. I don't know if the database and the biobank refer to like a, a data, database, obviously digital database is going to be stored in some hard drive, right? It's like an actual uh data in the sense that I would use data as a machine learning person but maybe physical isolate biobank means like actual physical samples so let's actually type that physical isolate biobank There isn't biobank. A biobank is a collection and storage of blood or tissue samples. Okay. So this is a physical. It's a physical biobank. And then the isolate is uh, the result of a single pick. So when you pick out of a agar plate tray like this, I think that individual pick, right, that little sample that you've created is called an isolate. Okay, so that's the rough end-to-end -end system there. And this end-to-end -end culture genomics platform can produce isolate collections from diverse input microbiomes with minimized manual labor. The entire imaging and isolation system is built using off-the-shelf components housed in an anaerobic chamber that provides real-time control of temperature, humidity, and oxygen level. Okay, so housed in an anaerobic chamber that Okay, so you can very carefully control the environment. I'd be curious whether this is part of the colony selection, right? You can imagine a situation where the uh, agar plate is brought in, and then you do the imaging, you pick out a couple colonies, and then you jack up the temperature inside this box a little bit higher. And maybe by jacking up the temperature, certain colonies thrive and other colonies die and then you can pick again samples. So given that they just said that uh, the pH, humidity, uh, oxygenation, and temperature affect which colonies are present, it, and the fact that they've put uh, the entire system inside a chamber where you can control the temperature, humidity, pH, oxygen levels, and so on, maybe the uh, picking system or the picking process is like kind of this multi-part process where you basically change the environment over time and that gives you a uh, different different types of bacteria over time. So I'd be curious to see if there's kind of a time component here where they change the environment in order to get a different microbiome. That would be kind of interesting. Okay. The Kami robot has an isolation throughput of 2,000 colonies per hour. Okay. Can handle 12,000 colonies per run. Okay, which is around 20 times higher than the capacity and faster than manual colony isolation by a person. Okay, so let's actually do some of this math here. So we have... 2,000 per hour. So if we divide that by 60 and then we divide that by 60 again, it's roughly picking every 0.5 seconds. Uh, 12,000 colonies per run. So that means that if we do uh, 12,000 divided by 2,000, that's six. So six hours. So each run. Uh, the robot is on for six hours, and it's picking roughly one sample every 0.5 seconds. 
And then they say this is about 20 times higher capacity and faster than a person, which means that if you take no, 0.5 seconds for the robot and multiply that by 20, that means that a human can roughly pick at 10 seconds. So human sitting there manually sampling this stuff is going to be picking once every 10 seconds. The robot picks once every 0.5 seconds. And then also higher capacity here refers to the fact that you probably can't get a human to sit there for six hours straight and pick <laughs> this amount of stuff, right? Six hours is just too much. So not only can the robot pick much faster than a human, but it can also pick for much longer, right? It's not going to complain. Close that out. Okay, to ensure that our genomic analysis capacity matches the robotic isolation throughput, we also developed a low-cost, high-throughput sequencing pipeline that leverages liquid handling automation to generate barcoded libraries for 16S RNA sequencing or whole genome sequencing. Okay, so the robot is picking so many samples so quickly that how the hell are you ever going to do uh, enough sequencing fast enough? So basically they have what they call a high throughput sequencing pipeline that leverages liquid handling automation. So I don't know if this is a separate machine or this is something that they just bought off the shelf, but basically a high throughput sequencing. The cost per isolate in this pipeline is 45 cents for colony isolation and genomic data preparation, 46 cents for the sequencing and $6.37 for, what is, WGS, oh, WGS means whole genome sequencing with a coverage of greater than 60 times on a Illumina HiSec platform. Illumina HiSec platform. Okay, so Illumina is a company that creates these sequencing machines and you see here they have a couple different types they have isec 100 they have the mini sec they have the next sec 1000 so obviously the more expensive one here is going to have all the features the world depends on your science cool is there a price can we see a price what is the price of something like this Products and services. Next sec. Okay, so obviously, <laughs> I assume that much like printers, the actual machine is actually sold at a loss, and then these like little test tubes and little like kind of like basically the ink in your printer is where they make their actual money. If I had to guess as to how this type of company prices their products, they probably have. Oh, look at this. Popular products, Illumina for COVID sequencing tests. They have specific machines for COVID sequencing. Nice. Okay, so this is what they're actually doing for the uh, whole genome sequencing. And it's actually important to note here that it's significantly more expensive, right? So the actual robotic picking is way cheaper. I don't know what genomic DNA preparation means. Maybe that's, uh, or no, that's part of the 45 cents. Okay, so there's a couple different types of sequencing here. So 16S sequencing seems to actually be way cheaper than whole genome sequencing. So 16S sequencing versus whole genome sequencing. Okay, what are the advantages of whole genome shotgun versus 16S? 16S amplicon sequencing is currently used to identify dominant organisms. WGS has been shown to detect and identify whole genera. Okay, so 16S is like a subset. It's like a faster, cheaper, dirtier version of whole genome sequencing, but it's like an order of magnitude cheaper, right? 46 cents versus almost $7. And that can be huge, right? If you have... 2,000 samples per hour, over 12,000 samples on a single run, and each sample is costing you $6.37. You can actually do that math. Let's see. $6.37 times 12,000 samples. 
that's a seventy-six thousand dollar experiment. Versus if you're doing uh, forty-six cents for the sixteen S sequencing, now you're talking about five thousand dollars, which is much more uh, doable. But five thousand dollars to get your poo microbiome explained still seems a little bit intense. Uh, a key unique feature of the Cami platform is the imaging system that collects and learns from morphological data of bacterial colonies, specifically trans-illuminated images, which show height, radius, and circularity of your colony, and epi-illuminated images, which show color and complex morphological features such as wrinkling. Okay, so we know uh, what they mean now uh, by multi-dimensional images. So basically the, the multiple, multiple dimensions here refer to the fact that there's two different types of imaging here. There's epi imaging and then trans image, right? Trans illuminated images and epi illuminated images. So trans illuminated, trans illuminated images, which is going to be this red one, is going to show you the height, radius, and circularity of a colony. So radius, I think, just refers to the radius of that circle. Height maybe refers to the height within the agar plate. And then epi-illuminated epi -illuminated images are going to show you the color. So obviously with a red light, you're not going to be able to tell the color. But with a white light, right, which has a much broader spectrum of colors in that, right, white is the composition of all the lights, you're going to be able to tell the specific color. Develop a custom colony analysis pipeline, area, perimeter, and mean radius reflect colony size, while circularity, convexity, and inertia reveal colony shape. Pixel intensities and their variances in red, green, blue channels highlight any density gradations and colors across a colony. We next reason that morphologically distinct colonies are more likely to be phylogenetically diverse. which could be used to improve colony isolation. Okay, so morphologically distant colonies. So they're basically making an assumption here and saying that if you have colonies that look very different, they probably have a different strain in them, right? So obviously that sounds like common sense, but that's not necessarily true, right? You can envision a type of bacteria that, uh, I don't know, maybe produces a random pigment. And in that case, that bacteria would, each colony of that bacteria would have a different pigment, even though it's all the same bacteria. So there is an assumption here that they're making that you should be able to uh, classify colonies of bacteria based on their morphology, right? And you want to pick uh, samples from the colonies that are the most visually distinct. So whichever colonies are the most interesting, the most unique, right? Those are the ones that you want to be uh, picking samples from in your colony isolation. Thus, we developed this image guided, imaging guided smart picking strategy to isolate more diverse isolates by embedding colonies in a multidimensional Euclidean space based on captured features and selecting maximally distant points in this space. Okay, so they're taking the each individual uh, strain or each individual colony right, then they're basically feeding it through what is probably a convnet, right, a pre-trained uh, convolutional neural network, which is being used as an encoder here. Uh, and encoder, what it's doing is it's basically taking data from one uh, space, right, in the space of images, right, the three-dimensional uh, image tensor. Or not three-dimensional, but there's three channels, there's a width, and there's a height. So images are in image space. And then the encoded, or the encoder, right, this convolutional neural network is projecting from that image space into a embedding space. And this embedding space is just some high dimensional space here. The way that they describe it is very correct here, multi-dimensional Euclidean space, right? And they're just taking the distance between the points there, right? So they're saying, here is the embedding for one colony, here is the embedding for a different colony, here is the embedding for a third colony and fourth colony, and let's look at the distance between those. 
And the bigger the distance between those, the more that the ConvNet is telling you that there is a visual difference between those. So, kind of a basic strategy here. Uh, I hope that they're not just using a pre-trained encoder that, or a encoder that's been pre-trained on something like ImageNet. I hope that they're kind of using some kind of specific, I don't know what they would train it on, but it seems like they would want to pre-train it on a specific problem that, or on a bacteria specific imaging problem in order to make sure that the features that come out of that ConvNet are useful, right? To further increase the diversity of bacteria that can be cultured and examined, Kami also uses different antibiotic supplements to enrich the most unique and diverse set of microbes. For instance, in a healthy human gut microbiome sample, H1T1. Okay, so maybe, I don't know what H1T1 is here. Maybe it refers to, uh, in the figures, maybe like... There's going to be images or figures here in the future, and H1T1 represents a healthy sample. Yeah, okay, so here are the different samples. So I don't know why they chose such a complicated naming scheme for it, but H1T4, H5T1, H6T1. Oh, okay, I think this might be human. So uh, they did say they had 20 humans, right? 20 human participants here. And then maybe f uh, some amount of samples per human. So H1T1 might refer to the first sample of the first human. So it's kind of like a way of anonymizing the data. Okay. Uh, in a healthy human microbiome, three antibiotics with different mechanisms of action elicited the most distinct enrichment cultures. Okay, so the T might refer to the, the environment. So... We know that they're using different environments, different agar solutions uh, that contain antibiotics such as ciprofloxacin, trimethoprim, and vancomycin. So different agar plates with different antibiotic solutions are going to result in a different set of colonies, a different distribution of colonies. So maybe H1T1, H1T2, H1T3, H1T4 refers to the different uh, solutions and environments that the first human sample is, is uh, grown in. So that's my guess. I don't know for sure, but that's what I'm guessing. To systematically evaluate the capacity and fidelity of image-guided colony isolation, we applied KAMI to gut microbiome samples for three human volunteers. Okay, H1T4, H5T1, and H6T1. Morphological data from plated colonies were analyzed by principal component analysis. I don't like PCA. PCA is very primitive and doesn't really work for anything that's high-dimensional. The PCA only works for like toy problems that they use you to that they teach that they use when they're teaching you PCA. Interestingly, colony density and size were the most dominant signatures that together accounted for 72% of the morphological variance. So the density and the size, density I assume determines how much light comes through. So like if a colony is very dense, not a lot of light is going to pass through and it's going to appear darker. And then size obviously is the uh, size of the actual spread. We then used the Kami robot to isolate 6,144 colonies. Roughly half of them were randomly picked from MGAM plates and another half using our imaging guiding smart picking strategy and antibiotic selection. Isolates were grown in 384 wells. Okay, so uh, this is where you're picking it to. So I think you pick it, right? Pick a sample from the plate and then you put it into one of these uh, like little plates, right? These, I want to say arrays, but I don't know if that's the correct word. Here you have basically isolated. So in this 
agar medium here, everything is in the same plate. All the bacteria are all playing together. They can interact with each other if they reach each other. But once you put them in this array and now they're all separated, uh, they are basically isolates because they're isolated. So that's kind of the word isolate there. And then once they have them all isolated, they do the uh, slightly cheaper version of sequencing, right? The 16S rRNA for taxon taxonomy identification. 16S V4 sequences are then clustered into ASVs. Okay, so the sequences that come out of a 16S process need to be clustered. And based on that, they get species level identity. All right. Remarkably, colony isolation performed by phenotypic data yielded a substantially more diverse set of ASVs than compared to random isolation for all three microbiome samples. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense that colony isolation, you're going to get better than random isolation. So if you were to just sample a grid uniformly across this image here, or across this agar plate, and then just put that uniformly sampled grid into this sample array here, this, this kind of set of isolates. If you do that with an image-guided uh, based picking, you're going to result in a much wider diversity of, uh, of bacteria or microbe species than if you just kind of sample it randomly, right? Which makes sense. If you sample it randomly, you're probably going to end up with something that's very similar to this, right? Where most of the time you're going to be picking the very common bacteria. But by being by doing this kind of visual guided imaging or visual guided picking, you can pick out the hopefully some colonies of this these kind of like long tail types of bacteria. Okay. Uh, to obtain 30 unique ACSVs, we require only 85 colonies to be isolated compared to 410 colonies needed by random, random selection. Notably, this enhanced isolation efficiency was maintained through picking, implying that there is a sustained advantage in using our strategy at a range of desired isolation depth. And the generated isolate collection better represents the underlying input microbial diversity was substantially e more even in composition as measured by Shannon's e equitability. Uh, Shannon might here be referring to Shannon, the information theory guy. So Shannon entropy is where that entropy. Claude Shannon, yeah, this guy. So information theory is basically probability, but you can use it to uh, make a bunch of theoretical guarantees on like how many times do you need to flip a coin to get a certain result, like how many times do you need to measure something to unknow what the underlying distribution is. So this this dude here, Claude Shannon, kind of pioneered a lot of that. So. I don't exactly know what Shannon's equitability is, but I assume it's basically just a similar kind of thing. It's showing you that this sampling strategy is resulting in a better sample than a different sampling strategy. Phenotypic data collection and AI guided colony selection. So this is okay, these are the four different parts that they described here in their CAMI platform. First part, of course, is just taking the images with the different lights, and then from that, uh, getting basically segmentation, right? Pixel level segmentation. Then from that, you uh, pick using your SCARA robot, and then you put each of the little samples that you picked into this kind of micro array, actually, biobank. Let's start using that as the terminology. That seems to be the terminology they use. I think this little icicle here means that they're freezing it. Then you put those little biobanks into this, the Illumina machines right, that we were looking at. We don't know which one they have. Maybe they have the cheap one. Maybe they have iSIC 100, the cheapest one. Maybe they have the NextSec 1000, more expensive one. 
But then once you do that, you get your sequence, and then with your sequence, you're able to classify into what type of bacteria that was. All right, so this is the image that we've been staring at for a while now. So this is kind of the two different types of images, the segmentation, uh, PC1, PC2. So this might refer to the principal component. So in principal component analysis, you're identifying specific dimensions where there is a maximum amount of variance. Uh, so this might be the first kind of dimension in which you have the most variance, and this is the second dimension that PCA chooses. Usually in PCA, you're picking two or three dimensions because those are the, that's the amount of dimensions that you can visualize on a plot. Here you have different types of uh, morphologies or phenotypes, right? So like the appearance, so like how is, what is the uh, uh, computer vision system actually learning? So here are a couple of the different things it's learning. It's learning about size, density, color, circularity, convexity, and inertia. Plating conditions, relative abundance. Okay, so this, this is the different environments. So here we have Vank, right? This is the Vancomycin. These are the three different types of um, three different types of antibiotics, and these are uh, different uh, environmental conditions, and you can see how depending on the environmental condition, you're going to have a different uh, distribution of bacteria. So obviously, here in Gen 50, almost none of the bacteria can survive except for this bacterio bacterioid acea. Need to learn how to pronounce this. But in uh, here, this TMP50, there's almost no bacterio, bacterioidacea. You just have uh, mostly this one, poor pyromonodacea. So this kind of shows you how, by changing the environment of the plate on which these bacterial colonies are growing, you can get a different spread. Um, and then finally here, number, bigger F, number of picked isolates, number of unique ASVs. So ASVs, I think, is basically the number of unique bacterial uh, species, I guess. And here you see random picking versus phenotype guided. Phenotype guided just means with the computer vision. So they're computer vision-based robotic picking versus random picking, which is probably just sampling a grid and you can see here how you get much better results you get a uh, number of picked isolates so this is how many times they pick and again they can pick uh 2000 times in an hour so this is roughly like a little bit less than one hour worth of picking and you can see that when you're using the imaging-based picking, you actually get a lot more uh, of the bacteria. You get a better sample. The thing that they don't compare it to, though, is the human-based picking. I feel like that would have been more interesting because, of course, you're going to be random picking because I feel like a lot of times in random picking, you're just going to pick, like, emptiness and nothing because the density is not super high. But I would imagine that a human, if a human is doing the picking, they're actually also doing some form of visually guided picking, right? The human is like using some heuristic that they've learned over years and years of picking samples, and they're probably going to pick from the center of each of these, which actually leads to the idea of like, I wonder if you could do some kind of reinforcement, learn, reinforcement learning uh, behavior cloning where you have a human pick from a plate and then you uh, basically do that enough times that you collect a data set and then you train a reinforcement learning system to mimic the human. And maybe some combination of mimicking the human and then just picking uh, the, using the vision system that they have here, maybe that will actually give you the best results. So uh, reinforcement learning based on a human expert versus just some kind of uh, pipeline like they have here, something they could have tried.
but either way, I would have loved to see the uh, number of picked isolates and unique ASVs for a human here. So comparing the phenotype guided with the human as well. Um, all right, let's see figure B here. We have the vinyl anaerobic chamber. So the whole thing is inside this giant temperature controlled system. You have glove ports, which is where people put their hands in. So they don't, they never really have the ability to enter the airspace of the, of the robot and the picking and the agar plate, which prevents contamination. Hydrogen sulfide removal column. Interesting, so I wonder if sulfides are uh, kind of a rotten egg smell, right? Sulfur, so maybe that's an air purifier. I'm not sure. Uh, plate sealers, airlocks, heated boxes, plate carousels, microplate handler, colony picker, the Hudson Rapid Pick MP. Let's look at that up. Hudson Rapid Pick MP. Automated colony picker. Pick up to 30,000 colonies per day. Look at that. So you have companies that are selling you these basically SCARA arms inside a box. Framework of the phenotype morphology, setup of the automated system. Data are analyzed by PCA to identify the set of most morphologically diverse colonies that are and that are then isolated by an integrated colony picker. So again, they're taking images of the colonies, they're segmenting them out, then they're taking the individual little segmentation parts, they're putting them through some kind of pre-trained ConvNet, and then they're the final vectors that come out of that, they put those all through PCA and then pick the distance in that. Hmm. So they're doing two dimensionality reductions in a row. They're doing the from image space into embedding space and then from embedding space into PCA space. So it seems unnecessary. Maybe they're not using a comp net. Maybe they're going straight. From images to PCA. That doesn't seem like a good idea, though. Okay, fecal samples were cultured with seven different antibiotics. So this is the seven different environments here. Random isolation was performed on a random subset of all detected colonies. And phenotype guided isolation was performed on morphology selected colonies. Okay, so maybe random is not completely random. It's not sampling, like, for example, empty space. Maybe random still samples the center of colonies. It just doesn't uh, pick which colonies to sample. So... Maybe here the random picking isn't actually completely random. It's still picking at the centers of the colonies. Phylogenetic analysis of isolates showed that CAMI optimized colony, colony picking substantially improved the diversity of obtained microbes. This advantage is particularly evident given that finding unique ASVs becomes asymptotically more difficult with an increasing number of isolates. Altogether, these results demonstrated our AI-guided data-driven isolation framework can substantially increase the efficiency of culture nomics. Okay, so here, genera generation of personalized gut isolate biobanks. Okay, neighbor joining tree, branch color distinguishes bacterial phylum. And the outer circle shows the prevalence of isolated ASVs. So 
the color here represents a different family of bacteria. So you can actually hear, see here how uh, the vermiculites, this light blue color, actually represent over 50% of the species. The bacterio, bacterioidetes represents roughly 25%. Actinobacteria, another 25%, and then proteobacteria, another 25%. And then you have this kind of long tail of different uh, families of bacteria here. Uh, here you have 20 people, uh, 576 plates total, over 100,000 colonies. And then from those 100,000 colonies screened, they picked 26,000. So roughly you're picking 25% of the colonies from the agar plate into the biobank. And then from those 26,000 uh, isolates, right, so little samples, they get 394 unique ASVs, which I think are these uh, unique bacteria. Uh, and I guess if you use whole genome, sample, whole genome sequencing, you get 3,000 isolates. So maybe uh, with the 16S sequencing, you get the kind of general family of the bacteria. And then with the actual whole genome sequencing, you get... Um, the specific like subspecies, right? I assume that it's actually probably quite difficult to differentiate between two very close, very similar types of bacteria species with um, something like the 16S, right? You probably need whole genome sequencing to really, really deeply know exactly what species of bacteria does, especially since they were saying that bacteria uh, evolve very quickly and they have kind of external uh, DNA and everything. So we call horizontal gene transfer. Uh, relative abundance, I guess these are the 20 people maybe. Relative abundance in bulk feces. So this is the 20 people here. And then this is the uh, all the different species that they got, right? So this shows you the gut bacteria, the gut microbiome of each of these twenty people, and you can see how it's actually it's, it is kind of similar. There is similarity here, right? There are bands that are consistent, but there is also a lot of difference here. For example, this HB one 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 person here seems to have a, a very different microbiome than this H14 person here, so. Isolates in personalized biobanks. This kind of looks like a lower dimensional version of this data. Average relative abundance. And uncultured ASVs. Cool. All microbes from different people share similar sets of bacterial species. The strains belonging to these species are highly unique to the individual. Yeah, so it may co-colonize the same host for many years. So your own gut bacteria is actually very unique because you're going to have specific strains because you're going to subject your gut bacteria to different environment and that gut bacteria is going to evolve in the uh, direction that you are exerting a selection pressure. To address, assess the comprehensiveness of this isolate collection, we calculate the abundance of isolated ASVs in the corresponding fecal uh, samples. Okay. What do we have here? A couple more images. Each personalized isolate collection mimics the bulk feces sample with comparable microbiome profiles and Shannon's diversity index. Demonstrate the use of Kami to build deep human gut isolate collection, containing 26,000 isolates and 394 ASVs with a rich set of linked morphological, phenotypic, and taxonomic and whole genome sequencing data. And they make this online. Identifying undercultured dark matter gut microbiome. 
Previous studies have observed that many microbes from different environments are so difficult to culture in the laboratory. Okay, so basically they're finding that a substantial fraction of the uncultured gut bacteria belong to these specific families, which have been previously documented as unculturable. So interesting that what they're saying is that there's actually, when you take your fecal sample and you put it on this agar plate, you're culturing it, right? And even just by doing that, you're already limiting the uh, bacteria that can grow on here, right? So there's going to be certain types of bacteria that are going to be able to grow inside your gut, but they're not going to be able to grow on this plate. So already you're creating a selection pressure uh, that is going to get rid of some of the bacteria that you would want to be able to identify within someone's gut. Uh, abundant yet difficult to culture bacteria. And they, they managed to find one strain that happens to be associated with inflammatory bowel disease. Or not associated, but um, a lack of this bacteria is associated with inflammatory bowel disease. Isolated and other abundant species. These results highlight cultured isolates and the remaining missing diversity based on our current media and growth conditions and offer directions to guide future culturonomics efforts. Taxonomy prediction from morphology enables targeted isolation. We lack the capacity to selectively culture most bacteria species in a specific manner. Consequently, picking a large number of colonies and relying on statistical probability is the only practical solution for obtaining bacteria of interest yeah, I wonder if maybe what they need to do is do a little bit more kind of fundamental research on like these agar plates. Like I wouldn't be surprised if, maybe I would be surprised, but there might be uh, different ways, different mediums of growing, different environments that you could create that would allow you to uh, more effectively pick and culture uh, hard to culture bacterias. Although I would assume that probably people have been working on that for hundreds of years. So maybe it's hard to find new types of agar that people haven't thought of before. Automated colony selection. Okay. To test this, we systematically probed our deep gut isolate collection to analyze the relationship between file morphologic and genotypic data. Interestingly, colonies of different genera exhibited diverse morphological patterns. I feel like I could have told you that. On the other hand, colonies are blah or smaller and fainter. So you are able to visually tell which colonies are which, which is kind of an, a core assumption of using computer vision to pick colonies. We assessed whether taxonomic identity of colonies could be uniquely predicted by only incorporating their morphological information on plates. We trained a random forest classification model, so pretty old school uh, type of machine learning there, random forest. Model performance was evaluated on the remaining 30% of isolates. Our model achieved 70% precision for most genera that had more than 100 isolates. The recall rate at the genus level varied more widely. So this is kind of what we were saying is that accuracy is important, but recall is maybe even more important. Some genera such as Egerthella at high precision and recall, indicating that highly conserved and unique colony morphologies could be specifically leveraged for taxonomic predictions. Yeah, so some types of, or some species of bacteria are going to be so unique 
uh, and a visual appearance that you're going to have a much higher uh, confidence when you see them. But other types of bacteria strains are going to be much more difficult to tell visually. Given that different people usually carry diff distinct strains of the same species, our results suggest that a high degree of strain level variation in colony morphology. Yeah, this is not good. Why is it not good? It's not good because it means that uh, ultimately you want to know what is your gut microbiome. But if I take uh, back a sample from your gut microbiome and uh, the same species of, micro of bacteria in your gut versus someone else's gut actually ends up looking different, right? The colony morphology is different in your, from the same strain, from just the same species of bacteria from two different people are two slightly different strains of the same species. And then I grow them both on an agar plate and they have very different morphology, then it's going to be more difficult for this whole process to work, right? This whole process works better in a world where the colony morphology is very consistent within uh, different strains of the same bacteria from different people. Uh, okay, models used to predict colonies. Morphology guided picking substantially improved the isolation efficiency. Results emphasize the value of our biobank data sets that link phenotype to genotype and demonstrate taxonomic predictions from visual colony features alone. Greatly enhanced targeted microbial isolation. You know what they need? They need a clip. They need a clip model, a contrastively trained genome sequence and uh, colony morphology model. So the same way that you took clip and clip has images with captions and you basically use a contrastive loss to create a model that can project images and text into the same shared embedding space. You could probably do the same with this. You could probably create a model in which you can project colony morphology and uh, sequences like the genome sequence onto the same embedding space, right? That's what you need. Data set is available too, so somebody could already actually do this. Interbacterial growth associations between gut microbiota. Bacterial colonies can influence the growth of their neighbors through species interactions, such as competing for nutrients or cross-feeding essential metabolites. Previous studies suggest that neighboring cells can critically affect the colonies in a predictable manner because E can track the kinetic growth of colonies continuously. So, okay, interesting. Not only is this a static computer vision problem, but you could have a time dimension here too, right? So it's not just the size of the colonies, but it's also like the rate at which they grow, right? The kinetic growth, like how are they growing over time? Could be uh, somewhere where you could take some signal from. Uh, a fecal sample was plated and imaged daily, and all colonies were subsequently isolated on day six, and their taxonomic identities were determined with 16S sequencing. Our in vitro conditions generally fostered growth to the same degree as in the gut. Interestingly, colonies belonging to the Fecalobacterium genus exhibited slower initial growth and only began to emerge in the presence of other nearby growing colonies. Yeah, so I think that one thing, yeah, commensual and mutualistic, mutualistic interaction. So there's kind of these like almost like cascades in your gut, as far as I understand, right? Like certain bacteria will consume a certain type of nutrient and then that bacteria will produce a certain type of refuse, right? And it turns out that that refuse is actually exactly what a different bacteria consumes. So there's, there's kind of like something complicated, a complicated energy source gets broken down into simpler energy sources, which are then used to feed different bacteria. So there's basically almost like a food chain of bacteria as well, right? Where uh, some bacteria are going to 
thrive on the excrement of a different type of bacteria. And that's kind of what they're describing here, how uh, these bacteria here, Fecilobacterium, they're actually very slow. They don't grow really well. But then if they're near a colony of some other type of bacteria, then they start to grow very well, probably because they're, they need the kind of outputs of that other bacteria in order to grow, right? This kind of like mutualistic behavior. More systematically studied species interactions enabled by Kami. We analyze the colony morphology, taxonomic identity, and colony neighborhood data together. We aggregated morphology data and physical coordinates from visually captured colonies and assessed whether a colony's growth is affected by neighboring cells. Very cool, right? If you're using a robot to pick, you know the exact position that it picked from. So you can actually, you actually in your database, you have not only what the colony that it picked from looked like, right? The image of that, but you also have the uh, the distance of that colony to every other colony, right? You you have the distance of this colony to every other colony. So that gives you more data from which you can extract a signal. Colony size of Volgatus is negatively correlated with the number of neighboring cells, consistent with the scenario that it, there are generally negative interactions mediated by competition. A larger colonies, yeah, so there's kind of this dependence on like, who are you growing next to as a colony? Looked at how the colony size of a specific genus could be affected by their genera the colony sizes of one genus with another genus present in the neighborhood and without any colonies present. Okay, so they identified some that grow larger if they have others nearby. Observe that Coca-Cola isolates are smaller. Uh, further investigation to better understand the underlying mechanism of these positive and negative interactions between microbi microbiota, right? It almost seems like this type of robotic picking is actually perfect to uh, kind of open up a whole new field of basic research where you understand the kind of relationship between these different bacteria, right? It's like you're you're now starting to understand the the ecology of the bacteria, right? The same way that you, you, when you want to study an animal like a cheetah, studying in its own habitat, understanding what it eats, understanding what eats the cheetah and what the cheetah eats, like that's important and how it interacts with these different species. So maybe we're starting to see the beginning of that as well, where people are starting to see how there's certain bacteria that kind of prey on other bacteria, certain bacteria that have mutual relationships with other bacteria and so on. Results highlight that Kami can reveal colony crow growth patterns governed by interspecies interactions, which may help identify growth-promoting microbiomes and their diffuse metabolites that stimulate in vitro growth. Intra and interpersonal genomic diversity. Mapping the strain-level genome-wide diversity of gut bacteria within a person is important for understanding the dynamics of gut colonization and the drivers of bacterial selection and adaptation specific to each human host. A advantage of the Kami system is the ability to isolate and perform WGS for a large number of isolates. Okay, so they're looking at how they change with regard to the 20 different individuals that they had. Most isolates within the same individuals had very few genomic variations. Uh, while isolates between people differed. So everyone kind of has their own subspecies strains of bacteria. Two distinct strains were isolated from H4 individual and two distinct strains were found in the H2. So you actually have multiple, you don't just have a single strain, you have multiple different strains of the same species within your a single person's microbiome. Uh, they accumulate more SNPs. I think SNP is like a measure of uh, difference. 
SNP DNA single nucleotide polymorphism. So a si single nucleotide polymorphism is the most common type of generic variation, and I think it just means when a single nucleotide is different. So in uh, bacteria or in DNA, right, you have these nucleotides, right, which are basically the actual like tokens, like the atomic unit of information inside DNA. And uh, obviously everybody's heard of GCA and T, TCA and G, right, like the four different types of tokens that exist within a uh, DNA sequence. And you can have some gene that encodes for something, and then one SNP would refer to uh, within that sequence of uh, nucleotides, there is one that is different. That's called a single nucleotide polymorphism. The number of genome wide. SNPs within each taxon is generally correlated with the abundance in the original microbiome. Okay, so this is interesting that you can look at the number of SNPs within a specific species of bacteria, and the more uh, SNPs that there are gives you an indication of the abundance in the original microbiome. Again, the reason they have this problem is that the abundance in the agar plate is going to be different than the abundance in your stomach because the agar plate is such a different environment than your stomach. So within your stomach, there might be certain strains that are thriving, but once you put them on this agar plate, there's going to be a different set of strains that are thriving. So and you're not really interested in which species thrive in the agar plate. You're interested in actually knowing what species are most populated in your stomach. So looking at the amount of SNPs can be a way of getting to that information. Uh, at the gene level, we also averged ev we observed evidence of convergent adaptive evolution. Okay, so basically, right, the idea that the gut bacteria are evolving within your stomach, and as we saw earlier, there's kind of very complicated uh, behaviors and interactions between these, right? There's a very rich, I don't know if biome is the right word. It's a very rich uh, set of relationships and hierarchy and kind of a complicated food pyramid with these different bacteria in your stomach. So you would imagine that if uh, the giraffes get a little faster, the lions get a little faster, right? So basically within your stomach, the evolution of one strain will affect the evolution of the other strains that have relationships with that original strain. Okay, so here specifically they're talking about this uh, toluene, which is some kind of chemical that is used in industrial feedstock, and then your gut bacteria is evolving to be able to cope with that. Another major driver within person gut microbe evolution is HGT. We observed that HGT were strongly linked to the phylogeny of the isolates. Most HGT events occurred within the same phyla, but also quite prevalently. Hypothesized that if HGTs occurred recently between two species, uh, HGT is a horizontal gene transfer, so that's where uh, genes and DNA get moved around between different types of species. It would only associate with a small proportion of isolates, resulting in a low frequency. While if HGTs occurred earlier and provided growth benefits, they would be enriched and vertically inherited by later generations. Uh, most HGTs were frequently present, especially ones within the bacteriodo bacterioid ACA, suggesting that they occurred in the distant past. 
and were enriched under strong selection within the gut environment. Okay. Given the high prevalence and frequency of within individual HGT, the next annotated, we next annotated the protein sequencing, protein coding sequences for the most widespread HGT elements to probe their potential functions. Interestingly, we identified multiple antibiotic resistant genes with different mechanisms of action as well as a secretion system genes, as well as secretion system genes. Okay, ARGs. So there's some kind of horizontal gene transfer that regulates these secretion genes. All right, discussion. Uh, before we read the discussion, let's look at the two figures that we didn't look at yet, or actually three figures. So we didn't look at this figure. Figure three, using colony morphology to predict taxonomic identity enhances, enhances targeted isolation. So genus level taxonomy, colony morphological features. So here we have red, green, blue, uh, the standard deviation of the red, green, blue pixel, the mean of the red, green, blue. So this is kind of like these six numbers here are a rough uh, way to get a color, right? Color for the bacteria. Uh, inertia, convexity, circularity, radius, those are the, uh, they showed us a picture here, but it's basically measures of like how circular uh, the actual colony is. So these are different morphological features, right? So this is what your computer vision system is identifying. And here you have uh, the different bacteria species, specifically at the, the genus, right? So you can see here how different bacteria have different morphologies. I wonder if this is per person. PCA ordination of genera based on their colony morphological features. So this is the actual PCA. Right, so uh, this is actually a good way to, to understand what PCA is, right? So every single one of these lines or every single one of these rows represents a genus, right? And there is uh, whatever this is, like 12 different numbers here, right? And it's very difficult as a human to know what the distance, right? Is the distance between Dialister and Finagoldia more or less than the distance between Dialister and Odoribacter? It's kind of difficult to tell here because each uh, each row here is twelve is kind of like twelve dimensional. Let me actually count: one, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So it's more like fifteen. So each row here is fifteen dimensional. So it's very difficult as a human to understand the distance between these. So PCA allows you to take this and turn it from whatever this is, fifteen dimensions, into two dimensions, right? So now. If each of these uh, bacteria only has two dimensions, I can plot them. And I can tell you very easily whether Finagoldia is closer or further away to Dialister, which is this one, and Odoribacter. Where is Odoribacter? Right here. So now, through the magic of PCA, I have. Oh successfully told you that, or I've successfully kind of understood as a human that Odobacteria and Dialister are closer together in this PCA space than Finagoldia and Odeobacter. So that's the magic of PCA. But the problem with PCA is that this dimension doesn't mean anything, right? Like they're, they're kind of misleading, right? So you have to take this with a grain of salt because the distance in this space isn't actually meaningful. It's like, right, think of it this way. If I have two bottles that are far away like this, but then I change the angle of it, they can look like they're much closer together, right? So from the point of view of the camera, the distance between these is very close, 
but in reality, they're actually further apart. So these kind of lower dimensional projections of a higher dimensional space can sometimes be misleading. So be careful when you look at PCA plots. Uh, here we have a nice little recall precision uh, plot for the different species, right? So you can see here that, uh, for example, this bacteria, Agarthella, high, high, high recall, high precision. Well, 75% isn't actually super great, to be honest, but out of all the other ones, they have the highest one, so it's very easy to recognize them, and you get pretty much all of them. Versus this one here, Roseburia, very low recall. Very rarely do you find all the Roseburia in the data set, and you're mostly predicting them wrong. So <laughs> there's going to be some species that are easier to tell than others. Uh, genus level taxonomy here, again, comparison between random picking and targeted picking. All right, figure four, mapping interactions between gut microbi microbiota of colony morphology analysis. So here you have the agar plate over time, so you can see how it grows over time. Uh, mapped, so here you have some kind of segmentation showing you all the different samples that were taken, I guess. I guess each of these points represents a sample. Uh, proportion of detectable colonies at different time points compared to day six. So over here you have in the x-axis uh, the time. Right, so there's six total days of growth. And the proportion of detectable colonies. So obviously there's kind of a sweet spot here, right? You want to let the colonies grow enough that you have a nice sample or a nice kind of like spread of all the different bacterial colonies. But if you let them grow for too long, it just kind of gets super busy and you're going to, it's going to be very difficult to tell them apart, especially if you're using kind of morphology and imaging to tell them apart. So there's a little bit of a sweet spot here. It'd be interesting, an additional way that they could extend this work is actually automatically picking the time that is best for uh, sampling. Okay, and then here, figure D, pairwise growth promoting and inhibiting network. So this is the kind of complicated uh, food tree. I, I don't know, I keep using, I don't know what the, what is the word for like ecological uh, web? Ecological network. This is it. This is what I'm trying to specify. Ecological network is a representation of interactions in an ecosystem in which species nodes are connected by pairwise interactions. These interactions can be trophic or symbiotic. So this is basically that plot, but for the bacteria, where it shows you that certain types of bacteria inhibit the growth of other bacteria, whereas other bacteria kind of feed off of one another. So you can see how Bacterioides and Clostridium IV are very strongly related here. There seems to be kind of a relationship between these here. Actually, a bunch of them seem to be related to these two here. These subspecies of Rumin Ruminococcia. I bet you Rumino refers to ruminants, so maybe this is like the, the bacteria that's found inside like cows and Goats, right? Ruminants are animals that eat grass. So, obviously humans don't eat grass to the level of cows, but it would kind of make sense that maybe there's similar-ish gut bacteria in our stomach since we also eat vegetables. All right, figure five. So, Strain level genomic diversity of the gut microbiome within and between individuals. Numbers after the species name represent the number of intra individual and intra individual pairs. Okay, so genome wide SNPs. Again, SNPs is the single nucleotide polymorphisms. So, uh, how much genetic diversity is there within specific species? So this is roughly a plot that is showing you um, 
the the variance at the strain level. So something like uh, this one here, Bacterioides cache, K. This one has a very low intra-individual pair, SNP. Means that I guess they're all more consistent versus something like uh, E. coli here, very widespread, right? So sometimes there's huge amounts of different types of different strains of E. coli, and sometimes there's E. coli that are very consistent. I mean, this is almost like becoming biology, you know, like my, my uh, knowledge of machine learning and like my my just background is just starting to reach its limits here because I generally don't know anything about like microbes and microbial families and like the relationships between these and like how SNPs eventually lead to speciation and like how that all works. But I assume if you're a bio person, this stuff is much more interesting to you and kind of starting to deeply understand the human gut microbiome and like what the uh, ecological network within the human microbiome looks like, especially interesting, I think, is the fact that it changes so quickly, right? So like, obviously, the African savanna has evolution happening and right, like the, the zebras and the lions are kind of like constantly in this like, tug of war over millions of years. And like, the zebras get a little bit faster, the lions get a little bit faster, the zebras get the stripes, so the lions have a hard time seeing, and then the lions evolve better eyesight, and so on. But inside the gut microbiome, this is happening incredibly quickly, right? It's like the speed of evolution is incredibly fast, and then you also have this horizontal gene transfer phenomenon where, you know, like a zebra could get some of the genetics from a lion, which isn't actually going to happen at the zebra-lion level. So it seems like the ecology within the gut and within bacteria species is actually maybe more interesting than the ecology at like the mammal scale of things. Cool, so we're almost done here. Let's finish with the discussion and we'll be done for this video. Strain isolation for the gut microbiome has historically been performed in an ad hoc manner where important phenotypic features are inadequately captured and poorly documented. We described the Kami platform to industrialize the gene bank of isolated biobanks. We then combined with low-cost 16S and whole genome sequencing. Uh, this isolate collection covers a majority of microbial diversity in the healthy gut and is one of the most extensive and personalized isolate biobanks. The majority of the data presented here relied on common MGM-GAM rich media strain isolation and characterization of the context of the human microbiome. So this is like the type of agar. And obviously I'm using agar as someone who's like somewhat ignorant in biology. And maybe agar is like a specific type of medium and then MGAM rich media would be considered something different from agar. But I'm just calling everything agar. So definitely feel free to correct me in the comments if you're a biology person, and I'm using the word agar incorrectly there. Interspecies interactions, that was kind of cool to see. Uh, we envisioned that these interactions could facilitate cultivation of dark matter. Yeah, so you could see how uh, perhaps a robot could take this plate and instead of sampling it and putting into this uh, biobank, right, this array, Maybe you could actually put it onto another agar plate and put it in such a way that it puts together these kind of mutualistic strains. So it knows that this strain and then this strain, they grow well if they grow together. So putting those together and then sampling out of that. So there's all kinds of interesting kind of, I don't know what the terraforming equivalent of like moving species around in an environment is, but it does seem like a potential area of improvement. The Kami system uses commercially available off-the-shelf components and open source code. We envision that a searchable online portal will facilitate sharing. Onboard automated microscopy could further introduce orthogonal data streams to visualize microbial cells at a micrometer resolution across different spectral channels. 
Yeah, so the different imaging modalities that they have here, I feel like uh, different modalities is a little bit strong of a word. At the end of the day, it's the same. It's a RGB image. It's just produce, you just have two different types of lighting. But I could imagine how you have more complicated forms of lighting and different types of cameras would probably be better. Because individual strains, yeah, so they actually aren't using any. They say improved machine learning and mach improved machine vision and machine learning could y yield even better strain predictions, but they don't mention the confident in a single part. So it seems like all they're really doing is just uh, getting these uh, values here, right? Which you could get with OpenCV, right? You don't need deep learning to get the mean value of the red pixels. And then they're just using PCA. So it's like they're using OpenCV and PCA rather than uh, any kind of deep learning based strategy. As far as I understand, I haven't seen a mention of a ComNet anywhere here. Uh, such comprehensive biobank, blah, blah, blah. Beyond the human gut, CAMI can be useful for other microbiomes, such as those from soil, aquatic, or agricultural settings. Yeah, so it's not just about gut microbacteria or fecal samples, right? You could imagine how someone who owns a fish farm would be very interested in uh, sequencing the microbiome inside the water of the fish farm. Uh, someone who owns cows, right? They would want to put the cow poop through here. So there's a lot of situations where people probably pay good money to understand the bacteria and bacterial ecology of their particular system. Cool, cool, cool. So this video is a little bit too long already, so we're going to like kind of skip over the uh, rest of this here. It's just kind of appendices and more information. But that was a cool paper, you know? We know a little bit more about uh, how machine learning and robotics is being used in uh, the biology world to improve our understanding of microbes and bacteria and all their complicated, wonderful world. Um, cool. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. And yeah, let me know if I got anything wrong. Let me know if I said anything that uh, is interesting. And let me know if you have any ideas about what you would do with uh, kind of next steps in this research direction. Like and subscribe and talk to you guys later.